This video has had something like 17 false starts. I've gone down a number of rabbit holes trying to understand a bunch of things, and I had at one point committed to making an entirely different video because of that. But then, I ran into a number of conceptual hurdles that I don't have the energy to address right now. So, we are back to the simple scope of that first one. Now, I'm going to be honest here. My main point with this video is to address a grievance I have with how the rest of the world seems to understand the United States and more broadly North American electrical system. While it's true that we have terrible, barely adequate receptacle designs, and our kettles are slower than yours, here's a fact about us that I think will blow a few fuses out there. The US is a 240 volt country. I can hear a lot of you going, what? But it's true. We have 240 volts in our electrical panels and at our disposal. You've heard about our obsession with air conditioning, right? Did you really think we are cooling our gaudy McMansions with a machine we just plug into a regular outlet? No. And some of us have electric stoves, electric water heaters, clothes dryers, and even electric vehicle charging now. We're not doing all those things with a measly 15 amps at 120 volts, or 1800 watts. How are we doing it then? Let's take a trip to the other room where I have a standard US service panel we could look at. Here's a standard US service panel we can look at. It might be a little hard to hear. I'm just kidding. I added that 60 hertz hum in post. Did you seriously think our service panels are some sort of disastrously loud thing? I bet some of you did. Anyway, this building is a single family home. That's important because of a little thing I'll be bringing up later. Now, this little wart thing on the side is a doorbell transformer. Pay no attention to that. And uh, also, um, any of the wires that might seem a little less uh, tidy than others are the work of yours truly, but again, not important. Now, inside, we'll find a main breaker at the top and a bunch of, in fact, to many people, an absurd number of circuit breakers feeding individual circuits. But there's still room for two more. The main breaker is a 200 amp breaker. This home, like many and pretty much all homes built within the last few decades, has 200 amp service. Now, you might be thinking that's 200 amps at 120 volts, so we have 24 kilowatts at our disposal here. But no, that's 200 amps at 240 volts. So in fact, many homes have 48 kilowatts to go around. 100 amp service is still fairly common, but that's still 24 kilowatts, plenty for smaller homes, especially since natural gas or other types of fuel combustion for space heating is still quite common around these parts. Now, take a look at these breakers and you'll find that they have their capacity printed on their toggles, and you'll also see that a few of them are weird. They take up two spaces for some reason. Huh. Well, those are 240 volt circuits. This one's going to a clothes dryer, this one to an air conditioner, etc. But why two spaces? That seems a little weird, doesn't it? Well, the reason it takes up two spaces has to do with the weird way we get 240 volts. You see, our power transformers that feed our homes do produce 120 volts, but twice. Yeah, it's weird, but first, a quick reminder of what transformers do. They're more than meets the eye. Pretty much the reason we use AC power all over the place is that we can use transformers to step the voltage up and down all willy-nilly. All you gotta do is wrap a bunch of wires around an iron core and they'll induce an electromagnetic field which propagates through it. Then wrap some more wires around the core on the other side and that field will induce a current in those wires. Simply vary the number of turns of wire around the core on each side and you can change the voltage according to that ratio. It's pretty neat. It allows us to transmit power through overhead or buried electrical lines running at thousands of volts. That lets those wires carry a ton of power for their size, because while the cross-sectional area of any given conductor affects how much current it can safely carry, when you bump the voltage way up, you can carry more power, that's watts, with the same amount of current, and thus a relatively small cable. This allows us to transmit power over long distances economically in the near megavolt range. Substations will step that down to a more reasonable 11 or maybe 32,000 volts for neighborhood distribution, and right before it enters your home, it is stepped down by a final transformer which delivers the final relatively low voltage to your home. Now, normally, you just hook a couple of wires up to the ends of the secondary winding of the transformer and call it a day. That's what you'll find in most countries around the world when dealing with standard single-phase electric service. We're just going to ignore three-phase for right now. The secondary winding produces a 240-volt potential, and thus you get 240 volts out of that transformer. And 
believe it or not, that's exactly what our transformers do. They produce 240 volts on the secondary winding just like yours. But the weird bit is that this is America. We're not going to settle for hooking up a measly two wires to our transformers. That is simply un-American. No, we must have three. That's one more and thus better. Obviously. This is where the weirdness happens. Our transformers don't just have taps on the ends of the secondary winding. We put a third central tap right smack dab in the middle, or center, of that winding in its middle. And that center tap becomes reference to Earth, and that is what defines our neutral. Doing this creates what is called split phase power. We end up with what behaves as though there are two 120 volt potentials 180 degrees out of phase from one another. Across either of those and neutral, you get 120 volts. But when you go across the two phases, you end up with the full 240 volts the transformer is producing. So now let's go back to the electrical panel. I'm going to take the cover off of it so you can see what's going on inside. This is the part where I say, don't try this at home. There are many things inside this box that can kill you if you touch them. I have a fairly good understanding of what those dangers are in here, good enough to run a few new circuits without injuring myself or burning the house down with so far a 100% success rate. But this is not something to play around with. I'm showing you mine so you don't need to see yours, okay? All right, here's where the magic happens. I know, to those of you in Europe this looks horribly gross and terribly unsafe, but that's okay. We're coping. Up at the top there are three beefy cables coming in. Those come from the meter box outside, but ultimately from the transformer. The two outer cables are both live at 120 volts potential to ground. The middle cable is, conveniently, ground, and also neutral. Yes, that middle cable is connected to a ground rod outside by the meter box, in addition to being connected to the center tap of the transformer. For those that didn't know this already, the ground plug and the neutral plug of your electrical outlets usually end up in the same exact place eventually. Right here, and on the other side. It's weird, and I don't want to get into it right now because it hurts my brain and there are particular exceptions so we're just avoiding that whole can of worms. If I take a voltage measurement between this cable and the neutral, you'll see that it's 120 volts, or thereabouts. If I measure from the other cable to neutral, it is also 120 something volts. Remember, those two pairs of cables are across only half of the transformer. Conveniently, they end up in the panel in that same orientation. This is the left side of the secondary winding, the right side of the secondary, and the center tap of the secondary. You will only get half the voltage of the secondary if you're across only half of its length. But across those two outer cables, you do in fact get 240 volts. Or close, anyway. Those two cables are at the ends of the transformer's secondary, so the entire potential is there. But you have to be across those two cables, not just across one of them and neutral, to get the full potential. And that's why our 240 volt circuits are on these weird double breakers. The lugs up here feed a pair of bus bars going all the way down through the center of the panel. A circuit breaker makes contact with that bus bar and provides an internal link to an output on a screw terminal. The breaker can interrupt the current path from the bus bar to the terminal, either manually with the toggle, or automatically in the case of an overcurrent event. This here is all a typical US circuit breaker is. It's attached only to the live or hot side of the circuit. The neutral side of any circuit goes directly back to the panel. If you look in the two spaces where there aren't a breaker installed, you can see the contacts from the bus bars that the breaker will attach to. On the bottom of the breaker, this contact will clamp onto the bus bar, which through the switch contacts inside the breaker, eventually make it to the output terminal here. The other bit is just to physically attach the breaker to the panel more sturdily via this plastic peg thing. The bus bars, though, aren't just going straight down the panel. They're a sort of interlocking comb shape. What this does is make it so that every alternate position down the panel is being fed by the opposite lug up there. In fact, you can see that one of the spots on the bus bar is connected to the right and the other is connected to the left. Now, if you take a look at these two circuit breakers, they're both feeding their own 120 volt circuits, but they aren't themselves fed by the same cable up top. 
Take a look, across these two breakers, there's actually 240 volts. That's because one breaker is attached to this cable through the bus bar, I'm pointing to the left one, and the other is attached to the other, that's the right one. Again, each one of these breakers is feeding a different circuit. If you follow the wire coming out from the breaker, you'll see that it joins up with a white neutral and a ground in one of these various cables. Those cables, they go to the various circuits in the building, or rather they are the various circuits of the building. And in the 120 volt circuits, across the black hot wire and the white neutral wire, you have 120 volts. The circuit breaker is there mostly to protect the circuit from being overloaded and damaging the conductors, or worse, starting a fire. But in conjunction with a grounded appliance, it will also remove voltage should the 120 volt potential come in contact with the grounded casing, because that effectively becomes a dead short, which will trip the breaker more or less instantly. But that's not important right now. But remember, the measurement we took across these two breakers, these two right next to each other, was 240 volts. If you want to get a 240 volt circuit out of this panel, all you need to do is create a circuit across both bus bars. And that's what these weird double breakers do. These are called double pole breakers. When you install one of these in the panel, it takes up two spots so that it can access both phases. These are actually just two circuit breakers internally bonded together so that if one half of it trips, both do. In fact, in some cases you can make a 240 volt circuit with two single pole breakers so long as you bond their trip levers together and they're the same size. To be clear, not all brands or styles of breaker allow you to do that and it may or may not be up to code anymore, but it is an interesting possible fact. And this leads us to another interesting fact. Many of our 240 volt devices over here are powered by two hot wires and no neutral at all. You see, the device would only need access to the neutral if it also needs access to 120 volts. Some devices do, but many don't. Now, you might be wondering, how do we actually connect our 240 volt devices to power? Do we have special plugs for that? Yes, but also sometimes no. Many devices, like water heaters or air conditioners, are simply directly wired into a circuit. Sometimes they'll go through a service disconnect, which may also have fuses in it, depending on the code and the device. Some other devices, though, do have plugs. We have weird plugs galore over here. See this clothes dryer? It's plugged into this bad boy. This 7.2 kilowatt electric vehicle supply equipment? It's got one of these on there. Did you catch that the dryer's plug had four terminals, but the charging station only had three? That's right, the charging station just has two hots and a ground. No neutral connection whatsoever. But the dryer has a neutral too. Likely the only thing that actually needs that is the little light bulb inside. Or maybe the motor is a 120 volt motor, the same for a gas powered dryer. but the heating elements obviously need 240. But the charging station doesn't need 120 at all, so it just has the two hots. Now, I'm sure many of you are asking, but why do you even do this? What's the point? Who is Max Mouse? Well, here's the neat thing about split phase power. Even though we have access to 240 volt circuits, nowhere in this building or indeed in this panel will you find a wire with 240 volts potential on it. Except in really bizarre or intentional scenarios, you cannot get an electric shock at 240 volts potential. You have to be touching both hot wires. Even in a 240 volt circuit, the individual wires are only at 120 volts potential to ground. And that makes our electrical system at least somewhat safer. I can hear all of you screaming, it's not the voltage that kills you, it's the current flow. It's the volts that jolts, but the mills that kills. You're right. But have you considered this? With any body of given resistance, the current flowing through it is proportional to the voltage. I don't know if you've ever heard of this little equation, V equals I times R. That's voltage is equal to current times resistance. When you increase voltage, that makes current go up too. And it's not like American bodies are a lower resistance than yours. Is 120 volts safe? No, of course not. You do not want to come in contact with it, and it can still very much kill you. 
But in any given scenario, if someone is receiving an electric shock, the voltage matters. You will always lower the likelihood of significant injury or death if the voltage is lower. There isn't some magical point at which voltage suddenly becomes dangerous. And without enough voltage, your body won't pass any current at all. I mean, take a 12-volt car battery as an example. It can produce literally hundreds of amps, many more amps than my circuit breaker panel can supply. But 12 volts is not enough pressure to send any of that current into your body, except in really weird circumstances like electrodes piercing your skin. People get really hung up whenever I've mentioned that 120 volts is safer because I guess they think I'm saying it's safe? I don't know. I'll be clear. It's not safe. And in fairness, any safety benefit we might get from it is obviously negated by the fact that our plugs are so terrible. I mean, the entire pin's length is conductive. You're just asking for a shock when you plug anything in. It literally just takes holding it wrong. And these big plugs are even worse. Plus, we have dumb-as-rocks circuit breakers in most homes and only put leakage current detection devices in bathrooms and kitchens. So yeah, we have way more opportunities to be shocked, and that is itself a huge problem. But it doesn't negate the fact that, all else being equal, and please understand what I mean by that, in any given scenario where one is receiving an electric shock, a 240-volt shock is unquestionably worse than a 120-volt one. Yes, 120 volts is still very dangerous. It can still kill you. You still want to not be shocked. That is priority one. But it is at least marginally safer, all else being equal. Now, to be clear, it's not just for safety that we've done this. In fact, likely that's just a happy accident of our history going back to the AC-DC wars. And for what it's worth, we never had quite the hardship finding raw materials for building wiring, so the thicker cabling required for 120 volt circuitry generally wasn't a huge consideration. Meanwhile, in much of Europe, the savings allowed by using 240 volts were substantial, especially in the wake of World War II. And then there are the ring mains of the UK. Look those up if you've never heard of them. They're weird. And fun fact, in the UK, they actually use split phase power on construction sites. In that case, the potential across the two wires is 110 volts, funnily enough, with each wire only at 55 volts potential to ground. This is done for the express purpose of increasing safety. 55 volts is even more safe than 120. 55 volts is barely above what power over Ethernet is. Anyway, since the stuff used on the construction sites is wired across the phases, it all runs at 110 volts. So I guess a fair number of UK power tools can be used over here. What do you know? Yeah, quick note, for some reason, lots of people will refer to our voltage as 110, and thus 110 220, or maybe 117, or 115, or even 125. Okay, to those of you that do that, just, it's 120. But there is no concrete exact voltage to any electric grid. It varies depending on conditions, so everything operates within a range of acceptable voltages. Usually here, I get something like 123 volts, but in other places you might only have 115, or maybe even 110. It's fine. Stop being pedantic about it. Anyway, that's all I really wanted to share with this video, a basic overview of the US electrical system so everyone is clear on the fact that we have 240 volt power. It's a little weird, but it's there, and we do use it. It's not like we're in the dark ages. Oh, right. And wait, that thing about the fact that this is a single family home being important. Ah. Recently, I made a video about fans and motors and how single phase power makes motors hard. Well, in that video, I talked about how in an apartment building, you might have 208 volt power rather than the standard 240. That seemed to confuse a lot of people, especially those of you who until right now didn't know that we have standard 240. Apartments often have 208 volts in their service panels because many larger buildings are hooked up to a three phase power supply. When done in the most common Y configuration, each phase is 120 volts respective to neutral, but across any two phases, you have 208 volts. In those buildings, your electrical panel will be extremely similar to that of a single-family home. There will be two hot phases, as well as a neutral. 
But those two hot phases are not from a split phase transformer, but are in fact two of the three available phases from a three phase transformer. And it's the difference in phase angle, 120 degrees versus 180, that makes the potential across the phases 208 and not 240. It's actually geometry, in a way. Or is it trigonometry? Whatever. Most of our devices which are designed to operate on 240 volts will happily operate on 208 as well. In fact, they'll often specifically have labels on them that say 240-208. The only real downside of 208 is that devices which produce heat will only produce 86.7% of what they would on a 240 volt circuit. So if you live in an apartment building, your stove will be just slightly less hot than it might otherwise be. Or, if you have an electric vehicle charging station installed on 208, it will charge slightly slower than it would on 240. But not a big deal. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this, and if you didn't know this about the US, have been enlightened, and will stop badgering me about only having 120 volts. Just about the only way we're held back by our weedy little outlets is portable things that make heat. Yes, our kettles and pretty much everything are capped at 1.5 kilowatts for an 80% safety margin on a 15 amp circuit. But really, aside from space heaters and tea kettles, nothing is worse for being capped at 1500 watts. And when we need more than that, we have options. We always had. Yes, our electrical system is very, very flawed and our receptacles do just suck. Really, they're awful. Just terribly unsafe. But specifically to Brits and Australians, your obsession with switches on receptacles makes no sense to me. I've received many befuddled comments wondering how we're supposed to turn things off without unplugging them. Well, first, all our stuff from vacuum cleaners to toaster ovens has its own power switch. Like, do you just not have that? Do companies design stuff for you assuming you've got that little switch? Because that's not my problem, that's your problem. Yes, we leave stuff plugged in all the time, but other than electronics, it's not consuming any power at all. I remember one comment I read saying that the fact our outlets don't have switches on them must be yet another sign of us being wasteful Americans. No, there are many, many signs of that, but this isn't one of them. You will never convince me that your switches on sockets are anything other than a mild convenience. And for what it's worth, we put switches on our power strips, so we have that option for addressing electronics with standby lights and vampire drains. Oh, but what about safety? My rebuttal? Just unplug the thing! You had to reach for the socket anyway to flip that switch. It's not my problem your plugs are so awkward. And no, sparking is not dangerous. A spark from inrush current won't hurt anything. Really, some of you seem so scared of various electricity things. I don't get it. I mean, shaver sockets? Really? Just put an RCD in the bathroom. And for being so afraid of that, your electric showers are baffling. Really, I know our electrical system has its flaws, but your perception of how dangerous electricity is seems really out of whack. And ring mains? Really? What year is it? Now, to be fair, your fuses in the plug? That's pretty cool. I'll give you that. Though they do seem like quite a foot hazard. I guess which is worse, shock hazard from 120 or foot hazard from UK plugs? Someone should do a study. Anyway, I really think that you guys just need to chill out over there. Electricity is not going to kill you. It'll be fine. That's what you'll find in most countries around the world when you... Ooh. To get that full potential... Oh shoot, that's not the end of the sentence. But you have to be across those two cables, not just across one of them and neutral. To get... No. Oh. And it can still very much kill you. But... Oh, you know, that's not how the line's written. Terminal. This other bit is just to... F yeah, I got that backwards. I lost, I already lost track of which side is which. Which one is which? It is this side. Yes, our kettles and space heaters. Oh. <laughs>